Throughout Lent, we've been focusing on the final words of Christ from the cross. But today's scripture is a little different. Instead of focusing on Christ's words, Jesus' voice gives way to that of the community, to that of the crowd, to you and to me, to an unremarkable group of friends and strangers who announce with great resolve that this is the one for whom we've been waiting for. Just imagine yourself. Imagine yourself there as a Jew in the year 30 AD. You would have been well-versed in the Hebrew scriptures, what we call the Old Testament. You would have heard the rumors of Jesus healing the blind man, of him bringing someone back from the dead. Perhaps you were there when the dirt was rubbed into the blind man's eyes or when Jesus commanded that they unbind this once dead, now alive man. Can you imagine what it would have been like if that Jesus was coming into your town, into your city? Or perhaps it wasn't even your town, but you went anyways. It's thought that over 150,000 pilgrims traveled to Jerusalem to be in the holy city to celebrate Passover. 150,000 pilgrims. That more than tripled the number of the regular population in Jerusalem at the time. And some of these people would have lived in the towns and villages just right outside of the city. But others would have traveled as far as Jericho, which would have been a several-day journey to get there. Perhaps they came for Passover. Perhaps it was Jesus' ministry that had captured them, spoken to them, prompted them to make the trip. It nourished their souls as they followed him to the mountainsides and to the plain revivals. As they experienced his touch, witnessed his miracles. As they listened to the gospel that he proclaimed. Just imagine it. There you are in the city, regardless of whether you were drawn to Jerusalem as a pilgrim during Passover or because you heard that Jesus was coming. Either way, you're likely weary from your travels. But then you hear this rustle of a crowd and these breaking of branches, shouts of praise, you run to the street. And there you see this man the one that you saw perform those miracles, or perhaps you're seeing them for the first time, and you're slightly shocked. Not only are you in the presence of this miracle worker, but he's nothing like what you expected. There's no white stallion or beautiful Clydesdale. It's not even a camel. It's a donkey. And it fits with the fulfillment of the prophecies that you know but you're still shocked that it isn't just a little more grand. I mean, you were kind of half expecting this procession to rival that of the Roman rulers. It's not what you expected. But still, you break off a branch and you lay the palm across the ground and you go for another and another. You want to make sure that when Jesus crosses in front of you that the donkey doesn't stir up any dust that it has a blanket of palms to walk over, a a royal carpet, if you will. But Jesus is coming faster than you expected, and so you take off your only cloak and you spread it at your feet just in time for the donkey to walk over. It isn't what you expected, but still you praise. You join in the hosannas, and someone asks, who is this man? And you turn to them and you say with confidence, this is the prophet Jesus. Amidst the shouts of hosannas, you you catch his eye, Jesus' eye, and he's looking at you and you hear and you see nothing. And then he moves on. In today's scripture passage, we see our there, ourselves there among that crowd. It's, it's easy to see. It's easy to imagine. 
Of course we would have gathered. We would have lined the street like any good Louisianian for a parade. We would have gathered in the streets cheering on our Lord, shouting, Hosanna, save us. Those shouts that scholars believe are actually more about acclamation and praise than a real cry for plea for salvation. And so we see ourselves there taking off our coats, lined it on the ground with the palms and honor and praise of this new and this strange king. We see ourselves lining the streets like our children lined the aisles this morning, perhaps as we did years ago, waving those palms ourselves. And together, we with the crowd, we proclaim this is the prophet Jesus. This is our Lord. This is the one that we've been waiting for. And although our scripture passage stops here today, we can't let this scene of praise be the last that we hear of Jesus before we return for Sunday worship next week. For without experiencing the darkness and the pain of Jesus' death, without that lingering time with the disciples where they think that they've lost their Lord for good. Without that, we can't truly know the resurrection. We can't truly celebrate Easter. And so I want to invite you here to join us on Thursday evening as we participate in the remembrance of the Lord's Supper, as we ponder that coming death of our Lord as we sit at the foot of the cross to mourn the death of our crucified Lord. And if you can't make it, which many people's schedules don't allow, I really want to encourage you to take time on Friday, on Good Friday, to read through that Passion Week narrative. Read the chapters from John 18 and John 19. Because we can't overlook the irony, we can't overlook the pain that the same crowd that gathered and laid their cloaks on the ground when Jesus processed into Jerusalem is the same crowd that turned on him. The ones that released Barabbas, the ones that cried, crucify him, the ones that lined the streets again, but not with palms and praises but instead with jeers as Jesus carried his cross to Golgotha. On this day, on Palm Sunday, we're quick to see ourselves as part of that parade of people processing, praising Jesus as he enters Jerusalem. But we're hesitant. We're hesitant to see our faces among that same crowd a week later. And that hesitation is understandable. It's natural. It's human. But deep within us, we possess the ability to do both, to be both. We are a Palm Sunday people as much as we're the Good Friday crowd. And I can think of no better way to illustrate that than Mel Gibson. I know it's poor form to bring up a controversial figure, but hear me out just for a moment. Mel Gibson's the man who directed and produced the film The Passion of the Christ. He paid nearly $25 million of his own money to birth this film, to bring it to life. A man who clearly saw this film as a calling, who poured out much of his own life into making it. And for those of you who haven't seen this film, The Passion of the Christ, or may not know, it depicts Gibson's gruesome, and I mean gruesome, interpretation of the Passion narrative, that week that led to Jesus' death. And in one scene of the movie, the camera zooms in on the hands of the centurion who picks up the nail to hammer it into Jesus' hand. The hand that we see, that hand of the centurion, is actually the hand of Mel Gibson. He said he would have it no other way. 
He said it wasn't important that the crowd or the viewers knew that it was his hand in the scene, but it was essential to him to show that he too was a part of crucifying Christ, that he held himself responsible, that we all were part of that death. I think that speaks volumes today because most of us currently know Mel Gibson from the headlines that he's made and not of the good variety. We know him as a deeply flawed man, as a person who said hateful things, not about a person or two, but about entire people groups. A person whose addictions have severely crippled him in many ways. We know him as a human struggling, as a Christian fighting to figure it out, as a sinner like us. Hear me when I say that I by no means support Gibson or his beliefs or actions or words, but his hands, especially as the flawed person that we know he is, the flawed person that we know ourselves to be. His hands, they serve as a reminder that we too are that crowd yelling crucify him if in fact we weren't the ones holding the nail. As we journey with Christ through Holy Week, this Holy Week, as we walk alongside the disciples, as we remember that we would have shouted out that proclamation that Christ was King, that this is the prophet Jesus who has come, and yet in our lives, we too are so quick to forget that Jesus is the promised one, the fulfillment of the prophecies. And so as we move through this holy week, I hope you'll begin to see your face among the faces of those in this story that maybe we have chosen not to associate with before. May we learn from them. May we walk with them that we may never forget that proclamation of the crowd, our proclamation. This is Jesus, the one that we've been waiting for. Jesus, our Lord. Amen.